Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette. This is number 206, where I read and review philosophy papers live on air. These are papers I haven't read before, it's just front page of fill papers. And so I read them, and I review them, and we find out what's going on. Synthes, haven't read something from them in a while, let's take a look at Synthes. Here people sometimes pronounce it synthes. I don't know. I should find out how to pronounce it synthes. All right, let's see. Do we have anything of sufficiently short length that can be read? Uh, we're not loading the web page for some reason. Oh, there we go. There we go. The rule of testimony in mathematics, 1 to 12. Let's see if that is available. Whoa, where am I? Oh, that's right, they publish a lot. I forgot about this. Presenternalism, presentism, eternalism, and where things are located. Uh, let's see, 63 to 74. That's like 11 pages. All right, so let's see. Is this available? I don't see it. Let's see if we happens if I clicky on it. And is this one available? Phil Archive, that's usually available. So you get a chance, the role of testimony in mathematics but you are not available. So, let's see what Philsci Archive has to show us today. T -t -t download. Now I like that, 15 pages, well it's not quite double spaced, but it's pretty good, so this is what we'll be reading. Thank you, Philsci Archive and Emmanuel Vibon. I apologize how I say your name. I say unless it's like your name's like Bob, something very uh, boring. I, I apologize for how I pronounce everything. <laughs> uh, okay, and so let me uh. throw the link in chat for you so if you join me live you can get the uh, link is now in chat you can always type exclamation point paper and the uh, link will pop back up uh, you can also send me suggestions I've got a bunch of suggestions I said I'd do and I have not gotten to yet but I will do them so if you are out there and you want me to read something, then I will get to what I'm sorry I haven't gotten to some of this stuff. <laughs> but yeah, so but here's what we're going to do for now. Presentism, eternalism, and where things are located. So let's find out where things are. Introduction. A long-standing debate in the philosophy of time concerns the question of whether non-present things exist. The main positions in this de debate are presentism and eternalism. Presentists hold that only present things exist. Eternalists hold that, in addition, dinosaurs and other non-present things exist. In seven, several recent papers, Daniel Deasy has argued that this debate is misguided and should be abandoned. Rather than investigating whether non-present things exist, philosophers of time should turn to the following question. Do things come into existence and go out of existence? Two answers to this question are permanentism, according to which everything always exists, and thus nothing ever comes into existence or goes out of existence. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's f fair enough. Synesemiotics. I have no choice but to point this out. Now completely impossible to have a paper called exclamation point paper written with the guy across. It just won't work. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? I mean, yes, you're not going to be able to have a paper called paper. But yeah, synesemiotics, I'm going to get to that paper you uh, requested. I've just been extremely busy in the last week, um, so or week, two weeks really, so I haven't gotten to it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the exclamation point. So, but that's fine. And Sirkin, I hope you have had as many Dorito chips as you could want. <laughs> but yeah, we've got a philosophy of time paper today. So, thank you guys for stopping by, and as always, please ask questions if I say something you don't understand. I don't understand it either, but I'll make something up. So, the, qu the answer to the question, do things come into existence and go out of existence, is 
permanentism according to which everything always exists and thus nothing ever comes into existence or goes out of existence and transientism according to which sometimes things sometimes something begins to exist and sometimes something ceases to exist <laughs> okay the main complaint DZ lodges against the presentism eternalism debate is that it is unclear because there is no good way of defining presentism. The traditional definition of presentism runs as follows. P. Always everything is present. I mean, if you're going to go by a definition, this is like as clear as actually definitions in philosophy get. Always everything is present. It's like just always in everything and then just is okay fine you can argue about every single thing in this paper if you want in this definition if you want if you're a philosopher but like that is as clear as things get <laughs> dz argues that no interpretation of the predicate is present in p leads to a satisfactory definition of presentism yeah i mean this is how you're gonna have to go if you want to go for it you're probably gonna have to jump on the uh copula somehow do things include persons? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, if you are a, an eternal, not a uh, what's, what's the uh, term, permanentist, then you you exist forever um, in some sense because the universe exists forever. It's always uh, permanent, and so things do not go in um, and out of existence because they always existed at the time block that um, they existed. Like so, the course of your life. Um, exists eternally that course of your life in like absolute time and so things include persons so you permanently exist in that time block which permanently exists in the grand scheme of things so it is permanent so yeah definitely per people and everything else too so um, so no interpretation of the predicate is present in P leads to a satisfactory definition of presentism. On some interpretations, presentism turns out to be trivial and compatible with eternalism. Collections of per everything, <laughs> everything since semiotics <laughs> is just the way things are. <laughs> Permanence is a coin which everything always exists. Like it's in everything always exists. So, all of it. Well, it's like the universe is permanent, is what it is. So, hey, what's up, Cirque? Yeah, so the universe, for permanentism, everything always exists exactly as it is. Like, over, like the universe is just sort of a static thing in permanentism. It's permanent. And so we may experience... Oh, it's okay. You can roast me as much as you want. Um, the universe is permanent, so in some sense, it's all, it's, we may experience it as, um, time, but that, that's just sort of like our perception of the universe. Yeah, that's fine, sir. Go right ahead. I can take it. I'm tough. Um, so, th the permanent universe doesn't change. Everything always exists within it, so. <laughs> Hypothetical things that are known to be fictional. Um, they exist as hypothetical things for all time because they don't, it, this is not making, uh, metaphysical claims on, like, uh, unicorns. So, this is making claims on things that, like, we think to exist or something, like, even like Santa Claus, yeah, like, uh, unicorns. Everything always exists, but it exists in the way that it does, as far as I understand the theory. So, like, Santa Claus exists because you can, of course, go get a thing of Santa Claus, and it's like... That exists. So that like statue of Santa Claus or that painting of Santa Claus that exists. So I don't think it means uh, like fictional characters exist in the sense that like they have the same existence that like you or I do. But the concept, the institution surrounding them, the cultural fact about them, um, that also um, that would always exist. So I, I don't think it's m trying to make strong metaphysical claims about the existence of what is usually considered to be non-existent objects. So. Alright. There are no analogous problems in defining permanentism and transientism, the author argues, so philosophers of time should focus their efforts on clearer permanentism, transientism debate instead. Okay, so this, the target here, this DZ person, wants to replace the presentism, etern eternalism stuff, um with a transientism versus permanentism sort of debate. Apparently, they think it does a better... It avoid, it sidesteps some problems. So, that's pretty recursive, but it's elegant. Yeah, these are... 
some of the main theories uh, going in uh, philosophy of time at the moment. So they 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 hold up pretty well. Um, this is the best we can do at the moment. So yes, yeah, not too bad. Oh, well, it's the best we can do. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's just the best we got right now. Is what people are arguing about right now. So, if successful, this argument would be a serious problem for a major debate in analytic metaphysics. Oh, sp speaking of, like, Serkian uh, sem semiotics, I'm going to be jumping on Serkian's buddy Bubba Bloop's uh, stream on Friday at, like, 6 o'clock. So, let me just... And we're going to be doing a Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So you get to see my terrible um, trivia things, so... So, I'll be over on that one on... Uh, Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So Eastern Time is oh boy, it's like UT, uh, UTC minus four. Um, so, but yeah, I'll be hanging out with Serkian and that crew on Friday. All right. If successful, this argument would be a serious problem for a major debate in analytic metaphysics. It is thus unsurprising that it has been criticized by both eternalists such as Cameron and presentists such as Talent. The aim of this paper is to point to a response to, oh, uh, no, Serkin, but hey, maybe Cinesemiotics will get to make fun of me then. Yeah, Cinesemiotics, you have to make fun of me then. Um, <laughs> you hope I beat, beat him? Yeah, why? Is that like bad time? You're on, what time is it where you are? Oh, that might not be a good time. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Serkin. I appreciate uh, your vote against Bubba Bloop. <laughs> philosophy is well practiced and tro troll proof philosophy is actually um like you could make the argument that socrates was the first professional troll and so we are actually very well uh, uh we have experience with trolling so the aim of this paper is to point to a response to DZ's argument that has so far gone unnoticed in dismissing a plausible interpretation of is present and claiming that it is compatible with eternalism. DZ relies on a mistaken assumption about how eternalists should treat tense. Oh, so this is a tense argument paper. Interesting. Once this assumption is removed, the interpretation in question permits a clear and helpful definition of presentism and eternalism. Thus, there is no need to abandon... Yeah. Oh, oh, oh so it will be 12 p.m. your time, but won't be home till 2 p.m.? Uh... Okay, well, you'll be missed. Thus, there is no need to abandon the debate between presentists and eternalists, and the debate about whether things come into existence and go out of existence should be seen as complementing, not replacing the debate about whether there are non-present things. I'll take a Chomsky matter-of-fact meanness. <laughs> presentism, presentism, eternalism, and the restrictor principle. You be I better be missed. DZ proceeds by considering various interpretations of P and arguing that the outcome does not lead to an acceptable definition of presentism. Well, let's see. So you're not going to be on stream, so you're going to be a, a gap. We'll have a Serkian gap. You'll be a negative entity on stream, and it will be a very big problem. So you'll have a negative existence um, in the metaphysics of uh, things. We'll have a negative Serkian presence in the... Uh, Terrible analytic philosophy way of talking. <laughs> A Serkian gap. Yes. War criminal, sorry. <laughs> okay. In this section, I will consider one interpretation in one of the interpretations discussed by DZ and the other, and the extended argument DZ puts forward against it before responding to the argument in the next section. The interpretation in question runs as follows. I don't think I'm a war criminal, <laughs> but maybe no, none of them ever do. The sentence, everything exists now, expresses a true proposition in every context of utterance. So everything exists now, express a true proposition. Um... Okay, so this is P1, the sentence, everything exists now, is an, expresses a true proposition in every context of utterance. So this would be a, pre, a uh, eternalist thing. Uh, I, well, that's that's really going to be the problem, Sirkin. We are not going to know what to do. It's going to be a problem, but I will, we'll find out when we get there. 
The underlying idea of this interpretation is that to be present is to exist now. This leads to the sentence in quotes, want, P1. The material outside the quotes captures the plausible view that theories in the philosophy of time are always true if true. Okay, so it basically says everything's trivial because when you say everything exists now, you're not actually saying anything because being now, everything that is now, is now. So that just is what now means. Uh, I mean, people are going to be like pulling their hair out and stuff, Cirque, and I don't know. DZ tries to show that P1 is not a satisfactory definition of presentism because it is trivial, even from an eternalist perspective. To arrive at this conclusion, DZ 11-13 argues that eternalists must accept the following redundancy principle concerning temporal operators. The standard temporal operators are redundant. So this is what I mean when I was saying everything is now, now, everything's now, when, when we just miss now, we just miss now, just now, when will then be now, soon, to quote um, Spaceballs. If eternalists indeed treat the temporal operator now as redundant, they will take everything exists now in definition P1 to be equivalent to everything exists. Then, however, P1 is trivially true and consistent with eternalism. So the argument concludes P1 is unsuitable as a definition of presentism. Guess it will have to be canceled? Well, no, it'll just be funny and sad when we mess everything up. Um, but that's okay. That'll be, uh, that's all content. It's good streamer content. So, you know. It's like watching a train wreck. DZ's argument relies on the claim that eternalists have to accept red. Red is, oh, standard temporal operators are redundant, redundancy theory. To support this point, he provides an argument that has its as its starting point the following principle concerning temporal operators, which eternalists such as Ted Sider seem to accept the restrictor principle. The standard temporal operators are implicit quantifiers over instance of time which restrict the explicit individual quantifiers, the upside down A and backwards Z, in their scope to things that are located in the relevant instant. One reason for eternalists to accept the redundancy print, uh, the restrictor principle is that it allows for them to account for common sense intuitions about sentences such as one. Right now, there exist dinosaurs. <coughs> <laughs> temporal operator, please deposit 98 euros. Yeah, exactly. Um, you do have to love some of the uh, technical terms philosophers come up with. Most people would take one to be false. Eternalism is in line with this intuition. If the temporal operator right now is interpreted in, cor in accordance with the restrictor principle and take to introduce a restriction to the instance of the utterance, in that case, one has the same truth conditions at 1.1, there exist dinosaurs located at the present time. Yeah, that's exactly it. We're going to get the, um, like, pity subs, Circian. Thus, RP allows eternalists to agree with the common sense view that one is false. DZ, however, holds that eternalists must reject RP because it leads to contradiction. His argument for the claim that takes the form of a reductio ad absurdum is based on the following premises. Holy crap, you just realized something important that I consider. By virtue of being delayed in when you read them and when they're dispatched to you, you're an example of the question about what... When something is located in time, I mean, these comments are an example of the question at hand, maybe. Absolutely. But it's, this is one of the things in relativity. Um, when something seemingly, when you think things are happening in physics at the same time, it's a matter of perspective. So I'm reading your comments at the speed of Twitch chat. So that's at Twitch chat time. You're you're getting my feedback at like five seconds later. And so the sense that this is like synchronous in any way, shape, or form isn't like this is a very um sort of displaced um like desynced experience actually. So the idea that this Twitch chat, all the things are happening at once, it's really not all happening at once. It's happening very close to the same time, but it's really not all um, the same time, which is one of the weird things going on uh, when watching Twitch, tw Twitch streams is that the game time, the streamer time, chat time are all different. So, but yeah, if you actually think everything's happening at once, I've got some bad news. There is no all at once. <laughs> <laughs> High pass in the semiotics. So, uh, here's the argument for reductio ad absurdum. 
sometimes principle. If something is the case, then it is sometimes the case. Non-instant mates? What is instant mates? All right. There is some X and some Y such that there is no instant at which both X and Y are located. Um, so that means they're just disjoint things. Okay. <laughs> SP is the temporal version of the mo modal principle that if something is the case, then it is possible that it is the case. Um, I don't know if you interpret sometimes as possible. Yeah, it, it can be almost a 30 second delay. I don't know why. I don't think think my connection is yeah, my doesn't say my bit rate's bad or my connection's bad it says i'm uploading at about two megabytes a second and my i'm doing pretty good but then again you're on the other side of the world so but yeah usually when i'm twi watching twitch streams i'm getting around a five second delay um this is exact well there's not necessarily poker but um what's it called Trading delays, you know, they put trading houses, um, high speed trading houses very close to exchanges because you can get an advantage if you are milliseconds or nanoseconds faster than the next trading house and you'll get a slightly better deal on a trade. They actually caught somebody uh, with inside the insider trader knowledge um, because they knew that they released some information in some location, say Chicago, at a time, and someone placed a trade in New York after that time. But they actually got caught with insider information because they placed it so quickly after the time uh, that the information was released that the speed of light could not have reached New York by the time by the time they placed the that the speed of light um that the information was leaving chicago at could not have oh you're in dc i thought you were in uh oh i'm i'm getting you confused with somebody else in i thought you were in some other uh part of the world but that's fine too yeah i mean but yeah let me finish this story the people in new york who put the trade on the exchange here could not have gotten the information based on the speed of light um because they couldn't have got the information in time. And so that's how they got caught by um, trying to get an edge on the competition. Because they were trading after the information was released. But the they did it on the, like, un uh, universal clock. Not the, uh, and not actually after when the information was released. And they got caught with insider trading for that. So, yeah. This is, it's not poker. It's high-speed finance. Yeah, for some reason I thought you were someplace else. No, that was the, uh, one of the other uh, people here. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me continue. So this is a temporal, temporal version of the modal principle that that if something is the case, then it is possible that it's the case. I'm not sure about something is the case, then it is sometimes the case. Um, it depends on your interpretation of sometimes. If it's possibly the case that there is some, if something is the case, then it is sometimes the case. It's, um, I suppose you could say it's a, all right, they're defining it as a temporal version of modal, but like, I don't always read it that way. All right. So non instant mates, and then there's something disjoint with that. And it, and, and Nim says something about how things are distributed in time. It is true. For example, that no, but Napoleon and Obama are taken to exist and to be non-contemporaneous as P and Nim together imply two. Sometimes there's some X and some Y that there is no instant at which both X and Y are located. And if the temporal operator sometimes in two is interpreted according to RP, is equivalent to the contradictory three. For some time instant T, there is some X and some Y located at T such that there is no instant at which both X and Y are located. DZ then claims that Eternals should not resolve the contradiction by abandoning SP. Uh, yeah, no, it was my fault. I got you confused with one of the other, uh, regulars here. Um, there's nothing, I didn't look up your, <laughs> I didn't look up your profile. It was just, I thought, um, one of the other folks is from the other part of the world. I mean, Serkin's on the other part of the world, too. But, not Serkin. He takes SP to be immensely plausible. How could something be the case but never be the case? 
um, and he holds that it would be absurd for Eternals to deny Nim. Eternalists are thus left with the rejection of RP as the only way out. If RP is rejected, DZ concludes Eternalists must treat the temporal operators as redundant, and thus accept Red, and once Red is accepted, the definition of presentism P1 is trivial and consistent with Eternalism as we have seen. New Zealand gang, let's go, exactly. The only sane pe in people in the English-speaking world. Like, you are it. The English-speaking world, like, bows to New Zealand at this point. <sighs> Which restrictor principle for eternalism? DZ's argument against P1 assumes I, that eternals accept RP, and II, that the only alternative to RP is red. I will now argue that both of these assumptions are mistaken. I will show that there is a different principle concerning the temporal operators. Yeah, go New Zealand. Uh, I wish we had a Jacinda Williams here running things. Uh, I will show that there is a different principle concerning the temporal operators that is compatible with <laughs> what some eternalists say on the matter, and that the, it has been explicitly endorsed by other eternalists. This principle does not lead to contradiction to SP and NIM. Furthermore, it is preferable to both RP and RED because it is in line with how contemporary semanticists treat tense. Here is the restrictor principle eternalists should, hold, should, in my view, accept. The interval restrictor principle. The standard temporal operators are implicit quantifiers over intervals, which, are, which restrict the explicit individual quantifiers in their scope to things that are located within the relevant interval. Yeah, everywhere else is just sleepy. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is different because it's um, giving the interval it's what what are we not moments in time but intervals in time and so this seems it's a different sort of object that th this is what uh this author thinks is good a different ontology of time not like points in time but intervals in time let's take an interval be de interval to be a set of temporally ordered instants let us assume that yeah yeah the, uh, that was uh that you just had uh, I was on a stream earlier, and someone was at their in-laws, and he was like, I re I'm really happy about it, but I have to be quiet because my in-laws don't like her. <laughs> like, oh, wow. <laughs> Let us assume that intervals can be instantaneous. Okay, so we can have an instantaneous interval. Interesting. Then IRP allows some cases in which temporal operators restrict the quantifiers to instance this is RP but it also allows temporal operators to restrict quantifiers to non -instant, non instantaneous intervals which interval is in play depends on one the in temporal operator and two on the context of utterance for instance the temporal operator now will usually introduce a restriction to the instant of the utterance so IRP de delivers the same result as RP for one on both principles and come out at, and both pins come out as 1.1. Right now, there exist dinosaurs, and 1.1, there exist dinosaurs li located at the present instant. A lot of boomers don't like her. Yeah, well, every they just had a uh, study released in like one of the papers here, and like everyone dislikes the boomers at the moment. Their generation is the least liked of all the like current generations. Um, like the generation older than them, the silent generation, everyone kind of thinks is okay. The millennials. Actually, people were down on the uh, Gen Z a little bit, but the Gen Z is kind of young. That's unfair to them. But like everyone else was like, yeah, well, they're okay. But the boomers, bottom up, like bottom tier. No one likes the boomers. I'm not like hating on them right now, but yeah, I'm kind of, the th the way things are going at the moment, they, uh, it seems like it's, uh, they've been in power for a while, so kind of blaming them but no, of course that's uh don't want to say all of them are bad some of them are bad but that's like everybody else anywho but irp you know what's interesting about this it seems like there could be some vote fixing in the framing um what was interesting was that the yes that that's true but like this was um like one of these stodgy newspapers it wasn't like just some like uh it wasn't like the, it was like in the New York Times or something. So it wasn't like they were trying to make the boomers look bad. That wouldn't be what the New York Times is up to. Of all the things that they might be doing, making the boomers happy is probably uh, something they want to try to encourage. I don't think making them feel bad about themselves because everyone hates them is uh, actually, they wouldn't do that if they were, if they could help it. 
I mean, by virtue of dying off their shrinking group to blame, it's the job of our parents to paragraph. <laughs> you know, maybe. The, uh, like, I, I've always been okay with the generation older than them, so. Yeah. But, uh, I'm not, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I'm thinking intervals is better. Like, the idea that now is a perfectly thin time slice of, like, instantaneously nothing on either side of it, I always found that kind of a weird uh, thing. Now is sort of, like, I'm talking to you guys. I mean, as long as you're leaving, right? You can just, like, we can all, you know, that's, um, it's called the, uh, that's why, what the, uh, goat, the, uh, scapegoat is. You put all your things on the scapegoat and you go and you kill it or whatever and you, like, get rid of it. So that's what a scapegoat is. Like, it was actually a goat that was, like, going off to be, like, killed or something. But, like, the idea that now is, like, a infinitely thin slice is a very weird thing. Like, I was saying to you guys, um, like, this, the now that we're experiencing is extended at this point. It may not be, like, like, that extended, but the slice that of, like, what we're considering, like, this interaction is not instantaneous. I don't know if anything exists in that instantaneous uh, slice. I don't think ontology even makes sense in instantaneous time slices. It definitely doesn't make uh, instantaneous time slices make sense in physics. And so I don't understand why we're accepting that in other areas. Um, quote from... <laughs> oh, I, you know, I haven't seen that movie in like forever, so I don't even remember at this point. I should go rewatch it. But so the fact that this is using intervals here, I think is much more reasonable. And the fact that they have to account for the now, I find very strange because I find this sort of instantaneous now very, very weird because we don't think in instantaneous things. We don't deal with anything in instantaneous things. Um, now is not a time. What time do you close? Uh, we close when I leave is the answer. But uh, <laughs> that's when we close. Okay, that's an interesting thing. Now is not a time. What time do you close? Yeah. But, I mean, there's something to that. Now doesn't... You can't actually use now in any... Re um... Oh, yes. Movies have a lot of this stuff baked in. Um... But you can't use the now as an instant in time. There is nothing you can do with an instant in time. I'm not sure why we focus on that actually i don't it seems maybe it's just a very very useful um abstraction um yeah but you see what's interesting about movies of course is that movies are always moving through time you can't actually n now is not a time and especially in movies now is not a time like what is a still in a movie there is no such thing as a still in a movie you can take a freeze frame of it but even then like to even like uh apprehend the entire um, like frame of a movie like that doesn't even make sense in any sort of movie way so you can like look at it but like then you're getting yourself into like what like the qualia the instantaneous quality of like the movie like I don't know what that actually is so I, I mean I find uh instantaneous objects very strange like the infinite time slices which a lot of this stuff goes to it's so you get very thin time slices so it's like like the instant like that instant like i don't know what that actually accounts to in even in a physical sense okay let me continue i'm never going to get through this paper <laughs> all right so but IRP reflects that other temporal operators, including was and will are more likely to restrict the quantifiers to non-instantaneous intervals yeah it's randomly randomly string together yeah no it's very little the everything has to be strung together in a certain way it doesn't make sense to separate instant to instant without having some connection with them yeah okay four there were several dinosaurs with beaks okay according to rp four has to be analyzed as 4.1 where t star stands for a contextually determined instant prior to the instant of utterance t oh thanks for uh, stopping by cinesemiotics i appreciate it there exist several dinosaurs with beaks located at instant t star by contrast the more flexible irp can also deliver the following different analysis for dot two in which i stands for a contextually determined interval so that that is located before t 
there exist several dinosaurs with beaks located within interval I. And you could say interval I, I guess, would be reasonably small, but not like instantaneous. 4.1 and 4.2, excuse me, have different truth conditions. 4.1 requires there to be several contemporaneous dinosaurs with beaks located at an instant before T, while 4.2 is true even if no dinosaurs with beaks are contemporaneous, as long as there are several dinosaurs with beaks located within the relevant interval before T. Below, I will argue that eternalists should favor IRP over RP and RED. But how do eternalists, in fact, treat the matter? By briefly surveying what eternalists say about tense, I want to bring up that there are few, if any, explicit eternalist endorsements of RP. Some eternalists leave open whether tense and other temporal operators concern instants or intervals. Others opt for approaches that conform with IRP and not with RP. Well, I just want to stop here make a comment on this paper uh, as opposed to some of the other papers I've read. A bunch of the other papers I've read recently, um, what they do in terms of writing style is they list the um, the all the sort of accounts of the that they are going to attack first. So like this one here, what they did was, you know, they, they listed what was going on um, up here with the account they were going to attack, but they didn't um, dwell on it. They went right in and said, you know what? We're just going to come out and bring up what our preferred um, account will be. And I kind of like this because I get sort of, dra it seems like such a setup in some sense when people like drag out what they don't like and then you, then they finally get to the end and then they're like, okay, and this is what I have to say. So in this sense is more of a dialogue on this paper, which I find interesting in terms of a writing style to get these uh, ideas out. Okay. So, but this is why I mentioned it because um, they will argue the argument now. So they're bringing out the discussion of the argument. And in some sense, that's a little bit more interesting to, instead of just starting with one uh, thing and then moving on to the other, this one we're starting here. Then we, we went a little bit here to give you the idea of like the flavor, of what's going to happen. And then we're going to have a conversation. And then the conversation is going to lead to, well, clearly wherever this author wants it to go. But in in sort of argument uh, writing structure in terms of philosophy, I prefer this method over the just sort of more straightforward, but also I think less interesting, just position one, position two, conclusion. Okay. Okay, to begin with, let's turn to Ted Sider's account of tense. As mentioned above, DZ holds that Sider accepts RP, and Sider does seem to lean towards RP in the following passage. For the eternalist, past and future tense claims are ultimately made true by claims that quantify over past and future time entities. For instance, in assertion uh, corner uh, quotes, it was the case that phi is true if and only if it is true at some time located before that assertion. The fact that Sider talks about truth at a time suggests that he takes past tense sentences to concern instance located before the utterance. However, Sider then goes on to provide an analysis of a past tense statement that is compatible with both RP and IRP. Constructing 5, dinosaurs once existed somewhat artificially as having this form, the eternalist thinks of 5 as amounting to 5e, there exist dinosaurs located temporally before us and then we've got the formula um there exists something x that's a dinosaur and before uh, x is before us um i find that yeah why are we using the formal logic here but like i can kind of understand but this b right here is a different sort of thing because it's a dinosaur and then there's like a b is for before but okay while this analysis states that 5 requires dinosaurs to be located temporally before the utterance, it leaves open whether the relevant temporal location is instantaneous or non-instantaneous. The view that Sider accepts RP is thus not unavoidable, and on a more charitable interpretation, Sider can be seen as indecisive on this matter. You know, again, this is my uh, disagreement with the instantaneousness of anything. It, it just seems maybe indecisive or just never really considered it. Nah, that'd be unfair to him. So yeah, whatever. It'd be unfair to Cider to say one way or the other what he felt. The same holds for the eternalist analysis of tense sentences provided by Quine. While Quine does not, to my knowledge, state that restrictions can be non-instantaneous, this, this is certainly compatible with what he says. 
Other eternalists explicitly acknowledge that tense sentences can concern intervals as well as instants. For example, Smart states that eternalists can adopt Reichenbach's token reflexive account of tense according to which 5 is analyzed as 5t. There exist dinosaurs earlier than this utterance. On Reichenbach's account, tense sentences are associated with reference times or reference events, and Smart makes this clear that in analyzing imperfect imperfectives, we need to refer to stretches of time as referenced times or reference events. Similarly, Ludlow adopts Reichenbach's account of tense and highlights that reference times or reference events can be non-instantaneous. In particular, Ludlow knows, notes that temporal adverbs such as yesterday, t- today, tomorrow can be construed as fixing the time of the reference, uh, reference event, in which case the time of the reference event has to be non-instantaneous. And finally, Meller's token reflexive account of tense equally entails that sentences can concern non-instantaneous times. A picture emerges on which those eternalists who pay attention to the question of whether tense statements always concern instants or may also concern intervals vote in favor of accounts that fit with IRP and not with RP. That is a problem for DZ as his reductio is based on the eternalist acceptance of RP. With IRP in place rather than RP, eternalists can avoid the aforementioned contradiction while having to give up neither SP nor NIM. For IRP, SP and NIM together merely imply the harmless and plausible 6. For some interval I, there is some X and Y and some Y located within I such that there is no instant at which both X and Y are located. Okay, so in some interval, there's two things and neither, like, two fists, but they're not touching at the moment. So they're not located at the same place, and in time, they're not in in the same time. We thus have a first reason to be skeptical about DZ's claim that Eternalists must accept red. Yeah, I mean, I must say, I am... I mean, the fact that I reject instantaneous things, uh, so I have to say I'm just sort of in agreement with this uh, author's strategy, which, for better or worse, is... uh, I mean, I don't know if that makes me less critical or more critical, but we'll see. A second reason to doubt DZ's conclusion is given by the fact that IRP is independently plausible, as it is in line with the contemporary semanticists treat the way contemporary semanticists treat tense in natural language, which which cannot be said of either RP or RIP. For example, IRP fits well with the following frequently cited passage by Barbara Partee. The deic <laughs> can't be the deic tick use of the past tense Morpheme appears in a sentence like seven. I didn't turn off the stove. When uttered, for instance, halfway down the turnpike, such a sentence clearly does not mean either that there exists some time in the past at which I did not turn off the stove or that there exists no time in the past at which I turned off the stove. The sentence clearly refers to a particular time, not a particular instant, most likely, but a definite interval whose identity is generally clear from the extra-linguistic context. Partee observes that the use of the past tense A depend on the context of utterance and B may concern intervals, not instants. The second of these points is nowadays widely shared by semanticists, as evident in, for example, von Steckow's review of contemporary theories of tense. Von Steckow sums up three of the main analyses of the past tense as follows, and I apologize for how I say everyone's name. I don't know if this is Steckow or Steckow or something else. I. Past is an existential quantifier that instantiates the embedded verb phrase to some time before the speech time. This view is attributed to tense logic, for example, prior. Two, past tense is a referring term denoting some contextually salient time before the speech time. This semantics is attributed to part T. And C, past is a predicate that applies to a time T and says that T is before the speech time. This view originates perhaps with Tao T. So, predicate, um, referring term, and then quantifier. So, different ways of uh, dealing with this stuff. At first view, these approaches may seem to fail, fall in line with RP because of the use of time, because of the use of the time rather than interval. But von Steckow makes clear that these that times are to be understood as intervals composed of moments. So, in fact, all three approaches fit with IRP with respect to the question of whether tense sentences may concern intervals and not with RP. And of course, neither of these the approaches entails that tense is redundant, so they clearly do not fit with red. At this point, one might ask, do theories of time have to conform with natural language semantics? Um, 
All right. Let me continue. We could always say more on that. That is a difficult question, but it certainly can but it certainly cannot do any harm for eternalists to adopt a principle that enjoys support from semantics. After all, the fact that a theory of time fits with how we talk is often brought forward as an argument in its favor. For example, it is frequently argued that one reason to accept presentism is common sense status, and one, reason, and one way for a theory to fit with common sense is to fit with how we talk. A principle along the lines of IRP might help eternalists to, to counter this presentist appeal to common sense, while neither RP nor RED are promising in this respect. Um, that's fair. I mean, it's not so much that it has to conform with natural language, but it does have to fit with common sense. I mean, the fact that natural language is one way could just be an accident of history, but common sense, I mean, of course, could also be accidental. But this is, I think, just because it's in language doesn't make it good, but for, like, common sense is supposed to have some sort of gravitas. Um, so, insofar as it do the natural language conforms with how we actually do things there's some there's supposedly some sort of a uh, reason we have to that even if the conformity with natural language semantics is taken to be unimportant there are good reasons for eternalists to accept irp rather than rp or red as dz's argument helpfully brings out RP, ah, uh, see, now the transition, they say, hey, because DZ is right about these things, you should all go with what the author likes. <laughs> uh, good strategy, author, in your writing style. <laughs> RP requires Eternalist to give up the apparently plausible SPR NIM, and Red turns a helpful definition of presentism into a claim that it is trivial even from an Eternalist perspective. We have seen that IRP does better in the first respect, and I will use the next section to show that it also does better in the second. I thus disagree with David Lewis, who remarks that Eternalists can treat temporal operators in line with IRP, but does not find restrictions to intervals of time worth the bother. Well, they wouldn't be worth the bother if, uh, like, infinitely thin slices of time made any sense, but I don't think that makes any sense, so, um, yeah. Sorry, Lewis, I disagree with you. Oh, yeah, and feel free to ask questions about stuff. I mean, I'm going kind of quick through this, but I think it's actually reasonably clear what's going on here. This person says, look, don't look at, like, instances or moments of time. If you look at things over extended intervals, the problems that the other theories had basically don't work, uh, don't come up. And this is just um, going through some of the details here, but not a whole lot more was said it's just working through the different problems so but yeah if you have any questions let me know presentism eternalism and where things are located let us now return to the question of whether presentism can be adequately defined dz's argument is meant to show that definition p1 is trivial even from an eternalist perspective p1 the sentence everything exists now expresses a true proposition in every context of utterance with IRP in place, we can state the relevant reading of P1 as follows. P loc. The sentence, everything is located at the instant of this utterance, expresses a true proposition in every context of utterance. Everything is located at the instance of this utterance. See, that is such a weird thing. How would you have an instance of this utterance when it takes time for me to read this, um, t to say this? Very strange to me. The formulation of P loc makes us makes use of the flexibility of IRP, which allows tensed statements to concern instants as well as intervals. IRP turns P1 into P loc due to the occurrence of now. Yeah, so this now turns into the the interval of this utterance, I would say, which usually picks out the instant of the utterance as mentioned above. P loc is not trivial from an eternalist perspective for eternalists hold that some things are located before and some things are located after the instant of this utterance. Thus, eternalists might define their view as follows. So the eternalist loc, e loc, the sense some things are located before the instance of this utterance, some things are located at the instance of this utterance, some things are located after this in of this utterance, expresses a true proposition in every context of utterance. And indeed, similar definitions of presentism and eternalism have recently been proposed by Cameron, though Cameron does not defend them against the argument I have been concerned with. Fair enough. I mean, so... This is always true that some things are located before. I mean, they're always, they always exist, but the, where their location is is really what uh, the eternalist is concerned with. So, you, like, you existed at some point, your parents existed before you did, and, like, there'll be people after you or whatever. But, like, you you exist forever, but where you were located in time is um 
because you're always the time is always fixed so like you're always going to exist in that location of time so you exist eternally but where you were compared to other things is um they can say that over different intervals does that make sense it thus becomes apparent that Eternals should rely on IRP rather than on RED in interpreting P1. Furthermore, P. Loke and E. Loke show that there is another way to resist Jeezy's argument against the presentism eternalism debate. Theorists can sidestep the question of whether Eternals should accept RP, IRP, or RED by making the intended interpretation explicit and providing definitions that are phrased in terms of whether things are temporarily, temporally located. Jeezy does not consider such locational definitions. Excuse me. And they do not seem to inherit any of the problems of the other definitional definitions he considers. But do these definitions adequately capture the disagreement between eternalists and presentists? Uh, That's what I was just trying to discuss before. Up until now, I have been concerned mainly with the eternalist perspective on the definitions. It seems clear that eternalists will accept e loc, and I have tried to show that they should not accept p loc. From in, from an eternalist perspective, the dispute is clearly captured. How about the presentist perspective? So, the p loc, everything is located at the instant of this utterance, because this is a true proposition. So this is the uh, presentist, because everything is located now, and so the, and the eternalist one, some things are located before now, and well, the, everything always exists for the eternalist. They exist eternally, but where they are in time um, is different. And so, sure, does this capture the um, difference? Arguably. So, okay. So, how about the presentist perspective? Here, the answer is less obvious and depends on whether or not presentists accept the existence of instance of time. Yes, yeah, see, I'm with the presentists of this one. Uh, this one. I don't know what an instant of time actually is. Let us focus on three presentist views on this matter. One, a presentist view that rejects the existence of instance of time altogether. Two, a presentist view that accepts the existence of the present time while denying that non-present time exists. Or three, a presentist view that accepts the existence of both present and non-present times while denying that non-present non-present objects or events exist. So the times are eternal, but the objects and events aren't. Okay. That's uh, interesting. The first of these positions is adopted by Merricks. In fact, I think presentists should deny that there is anything at all, much less some super thin slice of being that is the present time, just as they should deny that there are past times or future times. By the light of this position, both Elok and Pelok are clearly false. The sense, sense is quoted in the definitions, everything is located at the instant of this utterance. In Pelok, contain the empty indexical this instant. According to common ways of treating empty terms, this means that the sentences quoted are false or fail to express a complete proposition. As a result, the quoted sentences are clearly not true in every context of utterance, which means that e loc and p loc are clearly false. You know, I mean, just assuming things are false is a little weird, but you might uh, do some sort of um, something else to the proposition, whatever it means to fail to express a com- whatever this complete term is here. I don't know exactly what... Um, there might be other ways to handle this, but this is fine for now. I mean, why is not expressing a proposition mean it's false, or does it mean something else, or is there some partial uh, way of slicing this? Given Merrick's outlook, there are two. The two definitions thus fail to do a good job at capturing the dispute between presentists and eternalists. But it seems that presentists should not follow Merrick Merrick's in denying the existence of the present time, as I will want to, as I want to briefly argue. Firstly, Merrick's argument for the view that presences should deny the present instant exists is not convincing. The argument is given in the following passage. Now consider a view that starts with the eternalist picture of time and existence at a time, and then shaves off the past and the future, leaving only a thin, instantaneous slice called the present. This view agrees with eternalism that existing at a time, at any time, past, present, or future, is like being located at a place. But unlike eternalism, this view says that while objects exist at the present time, they exist at no other times, since there are no other times at which to be located. (coughs) Such a view implies that everything is instantaneous. This view is not presentism. Presentists deny that everything is instantaneous. They think that many objects not only exist, but they have existed and will exist. It is questionable whether the view Merrick's sketches indeed forces the presentists to hold that everything is instantaneous, as Cameron has pointed out. Even if presentists accept that all there is is a thin slice of being, they can nonetheless hold that some things 
are such that they have existed and will exist. So a view that accepts the existence of the present present instant of time does not imply that everything is instantaneous, and consequently, there is no reason for presentists to deny that the present instant of time exists. Um, yeah, this doesn't have anything to do with what I mean. I think this argument is, uh, this defense of the presentist is reasonable, um, what the, arg- the author is saying here. This is not what I was saying. I have other problems with the uh, time, very thin time slices. But okay. Continuing, secondly, Merrick's hold, rightly it seems, that presentists should accept that there are objects that exist at the present time. But it is not clear whether presentists can accept this claim while denying that there is a present time. As far as I can see, the claim that there are objects that exist at the present time presupposes that there is a present time. It thus is doubtful to say at least that presentists should deny the existence of the present time, and accordingly doubtful that such a position presents a problem for the definitions I have proposed. Yeah, I mean... I feel like um, you want to do, you want to pull them more at that point. You'd be like, well, here is a hand, therefore hands exist, therefore things exist. Well, I'd be like, well, you heard this at a time, therefore the time you heard it exists, therefore time like that time exists. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't make that an instance, but it does make a present time at that time, whenever that was for whatever duration or uh, interval as they're saying in this paper. So. I mean, you can laugh at me for my, like, uh, more style arguments, but I, I quite like them. I mean, this is going back to the uh, common sense argument uh, the author mentioned earlier. A more plausible presentist view on the matter denies only the existence of non-present times while accepting that the present time exists. This is the second position mentioned above. Yeah, this is what I have kind of hear people argue for, I think. At least I think I've heard people argue for this sort of thing. Cameron remarks that, from this point of view, P. Loke will seem trivially true and E. Loke trivially false. Given that only the present time exists, the sentence quoted in P. Loke, of course, expresses a true proposition in every context of utterance, and if the sentence quoted in E. Loke is read as stating that things are located at non-present times, it again contains an empty term, making E. Loke trivially false. However, Cameron not only highlights that presentists of the current ilk will take such a view of the, on the definitions, but also convincingly argue that such a view such a verdict is not a problem for the definitions. There can be meaningful a meaningful dispute between the two theories if, even if, by the lights of one theory, the definition of the other is, so, is unintelligible or trivially false. What matters is that the definition of a theory is not seen as trivially true by the opposing theory, and that is, is not the case with P-Loke and E-Loke. Presentists who accept the only the existence of the present time do not take E-Loke to be true, and eternalists do not agree with P-Loke, as I have argued above. Yeah, I mean... This is right. Just because you think the other person's an idiot doesn't make the argument, um, doesn't make you right. (laughs) Yeah. The third presentist view mentioned above accepts the existence of both present and non-present times while denying that non-present objects or events exist. From this point of view, both PLOC and ELOC are intelligible, and none of the indexicals involved are empty. Presentists of this kind will take PLOC to be true and ELOC false, So the view fits very well with the definitions proposed, but what reasons could presentists have to accept the existence of non-present times? One motivation for this view is brought up by the prominent presentist Dean Zimmerman. Zimmerman argues that accepting non-present times allows presentists to respond to Sider's objection that presentists do not have the resources to capture states of motion ascribed to objects by physics without appealing to the now disregarded Newtonian view of absolute space. Yeah, this is kind of where I was coming from, I think. I just can't. Like, it just seems so weird that, like, you people would hold on to a notion of time that cannot be physically possible. It would be unphysical, as my old physics professor used to call things like this. Presentist, the objection goes, can use tense operators to specify a series of snapshots of the world, but they cannot specify how the snapshots line up with the... Up with, up, line up with other spatially since such facts are not facts about what things are like at any one time. Yes, you need groups of things um, to organize the consistency of an object. Um, So you can't even do the 4D worm as it were. It doesn't make sense. According to Sider, this means that presentists cannot be cannot capture certain facts about states of motion of particles. So just so the uh, audience might know, a 4D worm is like if you uh, remember like when you're uh, old windows would would 
crash or if you won a game of uh, solitaire and like the image would sort of like you'd get a long tail of an image or the cards would bounce on the screen well you can imagine that yourself going through time you'd create like a worm of yourself moving along but see the question then becomes in this sense how do you connect one slice with the other why are they even like that you can't explain the motion of objects through time because there's no there's only the slices and the next slice is somehow a separate thing oh my god did i not have this on here the whole time i'm so sorry ah chat you have to tell me these things oh well it's not like you can see a whole lot anyway oh shucks yeah looking at the wrong stuff anywho I hate when I do that I apologize I should be a better streamer <laughs> oh well okay so continuing However, Zimmerman shows that presentists can avoid this objection by accepting the existence of non-present times. Yeah, so you couldn't even see what I was pointing at before. Oh, I'm so sad. What I... Let's see, I'm on 13 now. I didn't write too much on this paper. Sometimes I do. I was highlighting stuff. This is what I get for not streaming for a while. I'm all bad at things. So, yeah. This is when I was complaining about the copula earlier. Everything is present. It's okay. <laughs> complete proposition okie dokie he's fine however Zimmerman shows that presentists can avoid this objection by accepting the existence of non-present times while still denying the existence of non-present objects and events these times could preserve the distinctions between continuous and discontinuous inertial and non-inertial paths taken by particles and thus allow the presentists to capture the facts in question after all in Zimmerman's view, adding such non-present times to the presentist ontology should not count as a significant cost. Suppose I come to believe in a four-dimensional manifold with a specified structure because interactions among objects alone are not enough to explain why observable things behave as they do. Should this bother me as a presentist? Not much, I think. As an a-theorist like everyone else should... An atheist like everyone else should look to science for information about the structure of such things, including their metrical properties and the number of dimensions they have. My convictions about the unreality of past and future objects and events, on the other hand, are convictions about horses and wars and people. They have little to do with the questions about what sort of theoretical entities should be allowed to figure in science and scientific theories. There are thus good reasons for presentists to accept non-present times. On the one hand, it sh would be a significant cost to presentism if it were incompatible with contemporary con contemporary physics. And on the other, the commitment to non-present times does not appear to go against the general spirit of presentism and its negative view of non-present objects and events. You know, I this might work for these things, but I still don't know what it actually make. I I, I still have trouble. Um, making sense of, uh, like, infinite time slices, so, yeah, okay, whatever, if this works for you, that's, if it works for Zimmerman, then Zimmerman is happy, and if it works for you, more power to you, I don't, I don't see, I don't like this argument at all, to tell you the truth, but whatever. Of course, some presentists may not find this approach attractive, and Zimmerman himself argues that there are a way of answering Sider's objections that do not require the acceptance of non-present times. So not all presentists will accept non-present times, but even those who rule out such times should, as I have indicated, accept the existence of the present time and thus the second of these discussed, which is compatible with the definitions proposed. Even if, from a presentist perspective, the proposed definitions thus seem to do well at capturing the dispute between presentists and eternalists. Yeah, so I mean, the point the author was making here is that you can at least recover the old arguments because it would make it would be kind of damaging if the new way of looking at everything couldn't understand the way, the problems of the past. Even if the problems of the past are silly, you have to be able to at least understand what serious people like philosophers. These people weren't stupid in the past, and even though we move past certain problems and we don't like them anymore, we don't think they were important. We still have to be able to understand what like smart people were talking about. And if your new theory um, completely destroys like what the old philosophers of the past were talking about, chances are you're wrong. It's not that they were wrong. It's that you were wrong. You didn't understand what was important and why smart people were arguing about this. And so this is, although this is sort of just a, um, 
I mean, this author did spend a long time explaining why this um, is a, why the current debate can still rep, uh, explain the old debate. Why this is an important argument they didn't say is because if you, and I don't think this gets said enough. This is why I'm harping on it right now. Is that if you can't understand why the certain debates are important it's not because the old debates were stupid it's because you were probably missing um what what was really at uh what was really critical there so it's like if you think there's oh like so nowadays sometimes you see someone has like a technical solution to like one of these classical problems it's like that's that's fine and wonderful and you maybe like some really great innovation uh the modern like logic has uh, come up with but uh, but most of the time it's like Yes, the innovation is great, but really what was the philosophical dispute? Why were people arguing the two sides of this case? And when you understand that, that's the more important thing. And so this is why this whole, the author here, has spent so much uh, space arguing for um, why the old debate can be recovered from both sides. Okay, conclusion. I have argued that presentism and eternalism can be helpfully defined in terms of where things are located. If that is indeed the case, DZ is too quick in calling the debate between presentists and eternalists unclear and in demanding that it should be abandoned in favor of the debate between transientists and permanentists. This suggests that theorists in temporal ontology should address both debates, which lead to an interesting new question about how positions in one debate can be plausibly combined with positions in another. For example, do eternalists really have to be permanentists and thus thus accept that always everything exists forever, as DZ argues? Is a version of permanentist presentism possible, according to which always everything exists forever, but only things that are located at the instant of this utterance are concrete? In my view, it is worthwhile to look into these new questions rather than to dismiss the debate between presentists and eternalists as muddled. Yeah, see... Uh... Well, this is very, uh diplomatic a way to end the paper on because instead of saying DZ is just like being silly saying well look the DZ um, distinctions are still interesting in themselves and now we can actually sort of do permutations do the old debates how does the old debate and the new sort of DZ distinction do they amount to something good and new and so very diplomatic saying, all right, we still, the DZ distinctions are still interesting, but they're not interesting for the reason DZ thought. And so the old debate is still relevant, especially now in light of the new distinctions that DZ has brought up. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so I kind of just agree with the, uh, interval perspective that this paper, uh, was pushing. So that's always nice. Um, I like to say exactly. I I mean I'm not a philosopher of time. I've read a little bit on this, so I have some idea. I've heard some people talk about stuff a few times on philosophy of time. Of course, it's an interesting topic, extremely difficult. Um. So, it, it, this is a real nice paper in that sense too, because I thought this was pretty uh, well written and accessible. You could see what the debate kind of how it was going back and forth between um, the different positions. So that was really nice. If anyone has any questions, I uh, feel free to, to chime in now. I'm don't have a whole lot more to say, basically, but yeah, it's like between the different understandings of time, how do we sort of break it up? And this is sort of saying, well, does this new distinction go past the old distinctions? The author's arguing, no, it doesn't. But well, does it replace the old distinctions? And the author is saying, no, we still need this. The old distinctions can really still make sense if you take a, you stop looking at everything just as in the instantaneous way. But if it's a bit more, um, look at things over an interval. But that doesn't, of course, discredit the new way that DZ was uh, bringing it up. And so this sort of argument of what is actually important here. Um, is that's why it's a nice paper because it's not so much saying this is the right way to go or that's the wrong way to go, but saying, look, what is the important part of the debate in contemporary philosophy of time? And I think uh, this does a nice job of showing that there's like a debate here that can be had uh, depending on how we want to uh, break things up. Okie dokies.
Uh, I apologize for the beginning where I didn't have the uh, paper up. I didn't make too many uh, edits on it, so it's not a not wasn't a killer mistake. But yeah, uh, that's gonna be it for now. I sure hope everyone stays safe and has a good night. And I'll be back soon, as I was saying earlier. Also, I'll be uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'll be on Baba Bloop's channel, um, doing trivia. So. Doing streamer things. <laughs> Which is going to be cool. So. Yeah. Have a great night everyone. And uh, oh Sirkin have a great night. Uh, thanks for stopping by. So. Ooh, pogs. <laughs>